Okay, this will be Railroads and Industry Part 2. And we'll take up where we left off. We would, we're establishing that um, <clears throat> the uh, transportation market was overserved by the late 19th century, by the 1870s, 80s. Um, there were more railroads competing than there was business available to keep them all, to keep them all uh, profitable. So <clears throat> the railroads themselves suffered from the same hyper-competitive market that they had inflicted on, on uh, almost all the other industries. Okay, so what now railroad companies in their competition, this, this was serious. This was a duel to the death because there's not enough business for everybody and some of us are going to live and some of us are going to die and they ain't going to be me, if you know what I mean here. So, um, Generally, they can't just knock each other out at will. So they're looking for solutions to the problem, as they would have called it, of competition. They did not see competition as a positive thing. So uh, they, they attempted various things that they thought would regularize the market and make it uh, more predictable. Uh, one thing that was tried a lot and uh, didn't ever work was called pooling, pooling agreements. And this is where uh, various railroad companies in a given region would would just, okay, they're going to agree on a rate schedule. They're all going to charge the same rates, just let the chips fall where they may. Um, I have to establish something here. Railroads carry then and now, I guess, two different categories of things. Passengers and freight. People and goods. And freight is where the big money is. A passenger buys a ticket, sits in a seat, gets off the train when it reaches the station. That same passenger might own a company that's shipping three train loads a week. So freight is where the money is. Competition for freight is is um, it's price competition. Now, for passengers, that might be what we now call non-price competition, where it has to do with your on-time record, how few accidents and train wrecks you have, how comfortable the seats are, how courteous the service, all of that. But a <clears throat> carload of pig iron doesn't care about that. It's price competition. So the idea had always been to undercharge the uh, competitor so you'll draw the business or try to. Um, so pooling agreements, one thing that the, the seed of their own destruction is that not all the shippers, not all the customers are the same size so maybe your railroad company has entered into one of these agreements but there's a big fish out there and you got to catch them or, or you're finished sooner or later they're going to start cheating on each other uh, mainly through what were called rebates or kickbacks kind of works like this let's say you are a um, shipping agent for an industrial firm and you've uh, stopped by the office of a, a railroad company agent that you do business with, and you say, well, you know what? I noticed uh, your rates are higher than they've been. And he says, well, yeah. We've reached an agreement with all the competing companies in this area, and we're all just going to charge the same. Oh, well, that's, I hate to hear that. And then the guy said, step in the office here. Sit down and close the door. All right, to close the door, maybe close the blinds. He kind of leans across the desk and says, "Well, officially, all our rates are the, are the same." And I just, I just wanted to tell you, I just wanted to inform you that if you choose to go with us, if you choose to ship with us, we'll be happy to, we'll be happy to refund ten percent of what you pay. All right, that's cheating, isn't it? You say, "Well, I'm." <clears throat> I'm sorry, I don't believe I can do business with you. And he said, well, well why not? And you're going to say, well, other company offered me 15%. He says, what? what? So that's what happens usually to pooling agreements. They, they're unstable because the temptation to cheat, the necessity of cheating is, is irresistible. Another thing they did is not controversial at all now. At the time, in the late 1800s, it was called rate discrimination. Your rate is how much you charge for, say, a ton of freight. Uh, you charge by the ton, you charge by the mile. And if you're going to ship something today, either by rail freight or by motor freight, 
It wouldn't surprise you at all if you checked the schedule and found there's a price break for longer distances. That is, it costs less per mile to ship something a thousand miles than it would to ship it a hundred. That's per mile. Uh, or it would cost less per ton to ship a hundred tons than it would to ship ten. Nobody has a problem with that. But 150 years ago, out on the Great Plains, you had all these farmers hanging on by their fingernails trying to get on their feet. And it comes to their attention that the railroad company they depend on to get their crop to market is charging them more for their one measly little carload than it is the bonanza farm over the hill there for each of its 50 carloads. So that confirms to you, small farmer, what your daddy always told you. And that is that the big guy has got his foot placed firmly on the back of the neck of the little guy and is grinding his face into the mud 24-7, 365. And you're going to be fighting and mad about it. And it's not uncontroversial at all in that environment. Okay. Farmers moved fairly quickly to try to get control of the situation. The story begins in about 1867 or so when somebody established an organization for farmers. It was called the National Grange of the Patrons of Husbandry, or just the Grange for short. The word grange is an archaic word which means a barn. Okay? It was meant to be a social organization. It would be an organization where farmers could join and organize barn dances and barn raisins, whatever it was they would do for entertainment to get together and socialize. That's what it was for. I think it may still exist. I'm not sure. But uh, when you get a bunch of people together and they're all in the same business and they got all the same grievances, what are they going to talk about? They're going to talk about the problems they're having and they're going to realize they all got the same problems and the more they talk, the madder they're going to get. So, very quickly, the Grange, which became a major organization, apparently very, very, very soon, it became politically active. It did not align itself with either the Democrats or the Republicans. Instead, um, let's say that it's an election year and we're electing members of the state legislature. Um, the Grange membership included a lot of small town and country newspaper editors. Um, so they would, the newspaper guys would, would interview these candidates on behalf of the Grange and they would determine which candidates were friendliest to the farmers plight and problems. And the newspapers would then endorse that nominee and he would win. So it wasn't long before majorities in the legislatures of at least four uh, Great Plains states knew the reason they got elected was because the Grange had endorsed them, endorsed their candidacy. So they knew where their political bread was buttered. <clears throat> and by the early 1880s, uh, these states, at least four states, have passed laws outlawing these competitive practices. They outlaw pooling, they outlaw rebates and kickbacks. kickbacks. They outlaw rate discrimination, okay, um, at the state level. And there was a, a Supreme Court case where the Granger laws were peripherally involved but not directly. Uh, the decision did not mention those laws, so it was mistakenly believed they had survived a court challenge. All that ends in the mid-1880s when... Uh, the Granger laws themselves were the issue in a court trial, and the Supreme Court struck down all the Granger laws in one ruling, struck them all down. For sound reasons, the Constitution does very specifically give the Congress exclusive control over regulating interstate commerce. So the state laws, well intended and all of that, they were unconstitutional efforts to regulate interstate commerce. So they're gone. This um, coincided with a, an upsurge of public demand that the railroads be regulated. This kind of came in waves. If uh, times are good and prices are high, farmers don't care. Times are bad, they're going to be militantly political. So 
The result was a groundswell of support for Congress to act. If Congress has the power, time for Congress to use it. Um, so Congress, and this is the same bunch of legislative geniuses that cooked up the Dawes severalty act that <laughs> messed up the Indians. Same year, they passed the Interstate Commerce Act. Okay? At the congressional level, the the competitive, unpopular competitive practices of the railroads were banned. Now, this was one of the first times Congress had ever passed anything like this kind of law. In fact, the railroads were, should I ever ask, the first industry that the federal government ever attempted to regulate. Okay? So, who's going to enforce this? Today, we have more federal enforcement agencies and bureaus than anybody can even count. The only thing they had then was the Secret Service, which chased counterfeiters, and um, I believe maybe what's now the ATF. So the same legislation here, the Interstate Commerce Act, set up the Interstate Commerce Commission, which still exists for no discernible reason, and its job was to enforce the law. Okay. Now I'm going to lead you into just a wee bit of cynicism. Would Congress ever want the public to think it had acted effectively when in fact it had not? Oh, say not so. <laughs> yeah. So see if this sounds like effective regulation. Let's say you're a farmer out here or some businessman and you believe that the railroad you do business with is violating the Interstate Commerce Act. Okay? The Interstate Commerce Commission does not have agents out there snooping around all the time. They're waiting to hear from you. So you sit right down and write them a letter specifying which company and what practices you object to that you think are in violation. You send it to them and they get it and they uh, put, a rubber, put a stamp on it with the date it was received and they stick it in a file folder. That ought to do it. But then they track this and when they've received what looks to them like enough complaints of the same abuse by the same rail com railroad company that will trigger an investigation. Then they investigate, and if they find confirmation that a, the railroad company is in violation, then they drag them into court. And I can't look you in the eye and tell you whether this was a criminal or civil action. Looks like it'd be criminal. But they would take the case into the regular federal courts and the Interstate Commerce Commission would lose. Why? Because the attitudes of the time, virtually all federal judges had strong conservative pro-business values, and in its first, I don't know, 19 years, the, the Interstate Commerce Commission won exactly one case. I'm not sure why, how that happened. So, uh, Interstate Commerce Commission was set up in um, 1887. 19 years later, in 1906, uh, with railroad men pushing this, they realized what they really need is, is a predictable environment. They need a referee, and only the federal government could do that. So they'd come around and thought, okay, let's have some rules. As long as everybody follows the same rules, we'll be all right. So Congress went back and strengthened the Interstate Commerce Commission and then see, every solution becomes its own problem. That's what happens here. Um, it gave the Interstate Commerce Commission the power to be the judge and jury. They're going to write the specific rules. They're going to investigate to see if the rules have been broken. And they will be the judge and jury if, uh, if, if a question comes up. So that uh, completely abandons the uh, precept of separation of powers, where... The legislative, executive, and judicial powers are divided up among three different groups of people. This is the same people that write the rules, enforcing the rules, and being the judge and jury. So that's the first uh, so-called um, independent regulatory commission. Today we got over a dozen of them, and I will quit this and come back with more later.